Yes. Can we say amen one more time? That was beautiful. Thank you so much, Valeria. And uh, Daniel, thanks for doing double, triple duty today, doing everything that you've done, and to all of our, our volunteers. And uh, uh, appreciate everyone pulling together for us to have this time of worship together. Let's bow our heads for a moment. God, we just one more time recognize you, your presence, your love, your power here. We want you to be honored, Lord, as we've said before. And so we just turn our thoughts and attention to you right now, Father. Remove any distractions or obstacles that we have at this time from hearing your voice, Lord. And may this uh, continue to be a sacred time of worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm uh, glad to be able to be with you again here today. And uh, for teacher appreciation, I, I dedicated my thoughts and attentions towards uh, teaching and, and wanted to share some things about that. Uh, in our worship here today. I hope it's going to be something that we can all benefit from. But instead of a kid's quiz, I have a teen trivia since the kids are outside. So I, I do want our, our young people to participate, if you will. I didn't make them too hard, guys, so, so don't, don't sweat about it too much. I know you think, man, I go to school all week and then I come here and I have to answer these questions too. Um, but uh, I hope that you'll appreciate it. So we're just going to go through a couple quick questions getting us in the, in, into the direction of my message this morning. So uh, you may recognize this one. One honorific title was Jesus given in the New Testament. Was he called Sensei, Your Honor, Rabbi, or Governor? All right, Emma. Ra you sure he wasn't Sensei? You know, if, if, if the story of Jesus had taken place in Japan, he may have been called Sensei instead of Rabbi. I don't know. But yeah, that was one of, it was an, it's an honorary title uh, given to people uh, during that time. It's a relatively new title uh, in, in the history of Judaism as well. Um, we'll talk about that in just a second. So what does rabbi mean? What does rabbi mean? Here's some options. My master, my lord, my teacher, my great one. What do you think? Any of the, any of the teens here? I should, most of them are concentrated right here. Come on, guys. What do you think? Malise? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. What, what do you say? My teacher. Any other ideas? Danica, you can't answer, okay? This time isn't for you. <laughs> Anyone else? I mean, maybe she's wrong. What's that? Okay, she's right. Oh, Bob, we're going to give the young people here a chance for... You know what? They're all right, actually. This is one of those trick ones. These are the ones you want to get in school where anything you answer is going to be right. Okay, so the, actually it does mean all of these. It does mean my master, my Lord, my teacher, my great one. The I at the end of rabbi in, in Hebrew and Aramaic, that's always an indicator for my. So Eli or Elijah, my God is Yahweh or Zedekiah, my God is my righteousness or God is my righteousness. So, um, but it more became understood as my teacher or just teacher, just teacher. So Malise, very good. Thank you for, for playing. You get an A today. Oh, so I wanted to mention, so rabbis were actually a fairly new invention in Judaism by the time Jesus came along, or only been around about 100 years. 100 years is a long time, but when you think about the history of an entire uh, civilization and culture like Judaism, that's not very long. It became a popular thing, especially as uh, Israel lost its independence and they were still trying to maintain their cultural and ethnic identity. They began to identify people as being experts in their history and culture, especially in the laws of Moses. So a rabbi was someone considered to be an expert in the laws of Moses, and their word was considered infallible. If you were a rabbi, you pretty much couldn't err. Whatever you said, that was the truth. And by the way, that's largely true today in more orthodox and conservative Jewish circles. Someone who is a rabbi is extremely well regarded, and in general, their word is supreme and authoritative and not to be questioned. Which, by the way, is one of the reasons why the Nazis went out and purposely tried to kill as many rabbis as they could because they knew that they would have too much influence over the Jews that were in the ghettos and the concentration camps. So um, rabbis still, even to this day, maintain a high level of respect and authority within Jewish circles. But it was relatively new in Jesus' day. And, oh, good. What happened there? What looks going on? Good thing you're not paying attention. <laughs> what are rabbi students called? Oh, my. What a difficult question. Raise your hand. I want to call on you. We're going to keep order in this classroom today. Yes. Wow. How'd you know? 
Yeah, very intelligent. Yes, we know them in the Bible. Those who were under the instruction of a rabbi were called disciples. And in Jesus' day, there are hundreds of rabbis. There were dozens of messiahs and all kinds of uh, disciples at the time. So it was not an unusual or unique thing. It was an extreme privilege to be a disciple of a rabbi. People would give up their careers. It was like getting accepted into a very high Ivy League school today to give it some kind of comparison, which is why we see the disciples you know, leaving their family behind and leaving their occupation behind when Jesus said, come follow me. It was an extreme honor to have a rabbi. And Rob Bell suggests, I've never been able to verify this, that there was a saying among disciples that if you were to follow your disciples, disciples were to follow their rabbi so closely that there was a saying, may their dust be upon you. So you can imagine a rabbi walking, and you're supposed to follow up behind him so much that even the dust of the rabbi would get on you, and it was considered a, a, a saying of, of being a good disciple. Do you have the dust of your rabbi on you? If not, you might be in trouble. Okay, uh, we're moving along here. What teaching method did Jesus use the most? When you think about the teaching of Jesus, he's a rabbi, he's teaching. What method did he use, Juliet? Oh, Is that what you were going to say too? You didn't know what you were going to say. <laughs> Sorry. He used, say it again. Parables and storytelling. Yeah, today we would probably just call a parable an analogy. I think it's the same literary tool. Uh, um, Katie, maybe you can uh, clarify that with me or not. Uh, parable is, is where it's literally, it's a transliterated word. That's what the word is in Greek. It's actually parable, and we just pronounce it in English. That's what transliterated means. It's from two Greek words, para and bole. Para just means, it's a preposition, means beside. And bole, I always remember like throwing a ball. It means to cast two things beside one another to compare them. And when you think about the parables, that's exactly what it is. It's, it's God taking or a teacher taking something you don't understand and comparing it with something you do understand and saying these things have similarities and relationships. So Jesus would say, the kingdom of heaven, which is something you don't understand, but I want you to understand, is like a great merchant looking for fine pearls, and when he finds them, he sells all that he has to purchase the pearl. All right? Or the kingdom of God is like, and then he gives, you know, a farmer who goes out to till his land. Okay? So a parable is an analogy. It's a comparison of things. And that was the main teaching tool that Jesus used throughout his ministry. Okay, one more. True or false? It's very important. Teachers are important but not as important as pastors. I mean, you got a 50-50 on this, guys. Don't let me down. Oh, Paul's going to help us out. What? Paul, come on. Oh, yeah, and then you point to someone. Was it me? It was him. All right, well, I have an answer for you. Look at this. Oh, my goodness. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as, what comes first in this list? I didn't say, this is Paul, guys. This is the Bible. I didn't say it. And it's just very clear to me that pastors come first in this list, and then way down later, we find teachers. Yeah, the first, you know, George... Teen trivia, George. We're not talking to you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I'm just going to switch to kind of a slide here to Jesus affirming his role as a teacher. You call me teacher and Lord, so you're right, so I am. My, my goal today is really evaluate the ministry of teaching, the ministry of teaching, and to look at how the Bible elevates and establishes the role of the teacher within the community uh, not just the community, uh, uh, you know, outside the church and education and things like that, but within the community of the church as well. And so that's what I'm going to spend a few moments on looking at. Just a few passages in the Bible. I'll come back to that one in Ephesians in just a minute. But just a thought for you, just a question here at the outset. When you think about professional ministry, and by the way, I, I meant to say this earlier on in our teacher appreciation, I don't want to disregard our volunteer teachers that help with Sabbath school and help with children's church and VBS and, and Pathfinders and things like that. Um, I understand that teaching is something we all do to a degree, right? Okay, all should teach, but not all are teachers. You understand? Everyone should preach. The Bible is very clear about it. We're all called to preach, but we're not all called to be preachers. 
Okay, you understand? We're all called to minister, but we're not all called to be uh, uh, into ministry. And so there's this thing, there's the universal calling that all of us have as believers to engage in different ways of helping share the love and message and truth of Jesus Christ. But there are specific vocations that God calls us to as well. And that is the, the type of teacher I want to refer to right now, is those called to the vocation of teaching. When you think about the pantheon of ministry, when you think about those who are in the vocation of ministry, typically the average Christian, no matter what their background, will say, well, I would think of a pastor. A pastor is, a, you know, obviously a minister. We have the most visible form of ministry, standing before a congregation every week and in other ways leading and shepherding a church. Um, if we know church life a little bit, we may say, well, an evangelist. An evangelist is part of, the, of the, the professional ministry that we have because they go about um, sharing the good news of Jesus. We might think of a missionary. Okay? Missionaries give of their lives and they go to foreign lands or they go out to, to new territories to talk about uh, Jesus. If we think of an administrative context, we may think of a camp director or an, an officer at the conference, or the president or the, um, you know, the uh, uh, you know, children's ministry director or something like that. Um, if we're thinking biblically, we may even add the topics and titles of like an apostle or a prophet, okay? So there's all kinds of things that we often think of when we think of the profession of ministry. It's rare, though, when someone is talking about the profession of ministry to say a teacher is a minister. I don't hear that very often. That's not the type of language I typically hear associated. Now, we may at the back of our minds or after conversation or given some context, we may agree to that to some level. But what I want to suggest to you is that that's not just the truth at some level. It's the truth at every level. A teacher is a minister. And I think I can prove that to you, and I'm going to show how I think the Scriptures elevate and illustrate that. And it's an important designation, and it's an important concept for us both as supporters of teachers, as students beneath teachers, but also as teachers ourselves to recognize that that is a specific calling that God has had on our life. When you think about, you know, again, the profession of ministry, we often tie it somehow to Jesus Christ Himself. Right? Whatever Jesus did, it was part of his ministry, and therefore we can see that uh, uh, illustrated in the life of Jesus. And certainly Jesus was a shepherd. Certainly he was a pastor. He calls himself the good shepherd. He was an evangelist. He came bringing the good news. He was an apostle. He was sent of God from heaven to earth as a missionary. All these titles and terms certainly apply to Jesus Christ. But did you know there is no term applied to Jesus more in the New Testament than the term teacher? He is called a teacher more than he is called anything else in Scripture with the exception of Messiah or Christ. He's called a teacher. That's what he's identified, and he accepts that. Excuse me, spit. This is like the splash section. Good thing you're back. Um, this is why uh, Jesus accepts that. He does not reject it. He allows himself to be called rabbi and teacher and rabboni and these other ways that he's referred to in the New Testament. He embraces it. And we sometimes have this tendency to spiritualize that and say, well, he was a teacher in a spiritual context and teaching the Word of God and doctrine and theology and things like that. But it doesn't mean teacher in every case. I'm going to just reference a couple of passages with you today. I'll have one on the screen in a little bit, but these ones I just uh, want to take you to in the Bible right now. He's called teacher more than anything else. Doesn't that alone just get you to think for a moment? And yes, he's the Lamb of God, and he's the light of the world, and he's, he's all these wonderful, he's the bread that's come down from heaven. He's all these things, but he was called teacher. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You're not there yet in the young adult class. You'll come there eventually, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is talking about the body of Christ. He's talking about spiritual gifts. He's talking about unity in the church. He's talking about how every piece in the body needs to be operating together and how each of them has their role and they're so important. And then he comes down kind of toward the end of verse 27, toward the end of chapter 12, and he says, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third What's the word? You guys have your Bibles? Third, what's the third one? Teachers. Teachers. And then he lists some other things, but he doesn't even enumerate them. After that, he just lists them, and there's also miracles and helps and administration and, and speaking in tongues and things like that. And he's talking about these different things necessary for the body and the church to be successful. But in the top three, 
in the top three, he says there's apostles, there's prophets. We'll talk about those two offices in just a moment. And third, he says then there's teachers. Now, there's a tendency, and I've read lots of commentaries and looked at different ways. There's a tendency to spiritualize teachers here. And like I said earlier, say, well, that means teachers like pastors, Mitch. That means when you're teaching the Word of God. It means when you're teaching, you know, theology. It means when you're teaching doctrine. But it doesn't mean when you're teaching mathematics or when you're teaching soccer or you're teaching U.S. history. By the way, Oliver, what are your history? I may need to ask. We'll talk about it later. Anyway, when you're talking history, we tend, to, we tend to spiritualize the teacher role here. And then in real life, we de-spiritualize the other elements of teaching. And I want to just suggest to you, that's a mistake. That is a mistake. Okay? Whenever you teach, whatever you're teaching, if it is true, it is of God. And I, I, I bring to your, ta- your thoughts and your attention, I think it's a great illustration. I don't know if you'll like it or not, but I'm, I'm going to throw it out here and see if you like it. You remember the story of Job? Remember the story of Job? He's suffering greatly, and he doesn't understand what's going on. He's seeking answers. He wants to know what God's plan is, and it's just awful and it's terrible. And he has these three friends talking to him. They're not doing much help, though. Uh, and in, 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 in Job 36, 22, Elihu says to Job, he says, Behold, God is exalted in power who is a teacher like him? Now, I want to pause there just for a second because I think this is a profound statement. He says to Job, Behold, God is exalted in power. And of all the things he could say of God after that, he's supreme, he's sovereign, he's righteous, he's holy. He says, Who is a teacher like him? Now, I want to ask you a question. Do teachers have a lot of power or not? Do you, th- when you really think about the type of power teachers have in our society, it's scary. Uh, uh, Caleb, where are you, Caleb? You and I, we better get to a point where we agree on more. Because when, Ka- when Toby comes home and says, hey, Dad, Caleb tells me this, it doesn't matter what I say, he believes Caleb more than me. You know what, some parents, you know what I'm talking about? Your kids come home and you say, well, teacher told me this. You're like, well, I'm not sure that's right. Well, teacher said it. <laughs> the power, the te- specifically our elementary, and I don't mean to, you know, all teachers are included here, but the elementary teachers will spend more dedicated one-on-one time with their student than anyone else during that period of, of, a, of a young person's life right? They may go home and spend more hours, but they're not having that one-on-one time. Uh, so what a te- the power that a teacher has is massive, massive. And it's acknowledged here, behold, God is exalted in power. Who is a teacher like him? And then if you remember the rest of the book of Job, God takes Job through all kinds of creation to illustrate the plan of God to him. Job, in, in, in Job 38, God answers Job out of the world when he says, who is this who darkens knowledge and says words, or, or darkens counsel and says words without knowledge? God says to Job, you think you're so smart, you need knowledge. And he says, now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you and you will instruct me. Oh, he gets into some real passive-aggressive sarcasm here. I love the book of Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have knowledge. Who set its measurement since you know? Who set its boundaries? Who stretched its line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? When the, suns, when, the st- uh, when the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Who enclosed the seas with its bars? When bursting forth, it went forth from the womb. And I'm the one who gave the cloud as its garment and the deep darkness its swaddling band. I'm the one that enclosed the sea and set its bars and its gates and said, Thus far you shall come and no farther. Here your proud waves shall stop. And all throughout an examination of, of, of creation and nature and history, God takes Job through the knowledge that he needs to appreciate him. And in the final chapters of Job, you have science, you have mathematics, you have astronomy, you have rhetoric and poetry, you have satire. God uses these things that we would sometimes think of as secular knowledge and uses it to draw Job closer to him. I think it was Kepler who said that when I look at the stars, it's though I'm looking into the face of God. And Newton who said, when I contemplate the universe, it's though I'm thinking the thoughts of God. When you teach science, you're teaching the science of God. When you're teaching mathematics, you're teaching the mathematics of God. When you're teaching economics, you understand what I'm saying? The work of the teacher 
is a ministry. Ephesians chapter uh, 4, then, I'm going to come to that verse that I had on the screen earlier during the quiz. Ephesians chapter 4. And uh, I want to read back a little bit. We're going to come all the way to verse 1 of Ephesians 4. And again, I want you to think of this in the context of the teacher as a minister. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, Paul says, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Is teaching a calling? I would say to you, it's a calling. If you're not called to do it, don't do it. You won't be happy and no one else will be happy. Same is true for a lot of ministries of pastoring. And, and there's other professions too. I think my wife is called to be a nurse. And I think that that's a thing that she needs to do and she's called to do. So I'm not trying to limit it to these things. But it says, be worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Now listen to the qualities that he gives here. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I'm telling you guys, friends, this morning, these qualities are sorely needed in our world right now. Humility, gentleness, patience, tolerance for one another in love. I just heard a statistic this week. 20% of collegiate students believe that violence against innocent people is acceptable when the society does not accept their interpretation of justice. 20% of college students today believe that violence hurting people who are innocent is acceptable. I'm not talking about in some third world country, I'm talking about America. That is where we're headed as a society. These are the future leaders. These are the future. What does it say? We should be diligent and we should teach humility and gentleness with patience, showing tolerance in love. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope to your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Then Paul comes down to, again, identify different roles in which God has established people within the ministry to help fulfill these values and these goals. And so we come down to verse 11. And that was a verse I put on facetiously during the quiz. And he has given some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists. He's, he's added that from the list in, in 1 Corinthians. And then some as pastors and teachers. Now, there's the appearance of hierarchy here. It looks as though there's a hierarchy. And I'm not saying that there's no, no hierarchy at all. But hierarchy is not the point. In other words, he's not saying that uh, apostles are the most important and then they're subjugated by prophets and then prophets are... You know, he, uh, okay, so there, there, there's an argument to be made for hierarchy, but the point is not hierarchy. The point is ministry. The point is ministry. And what Paul is talking about here, in a pagan world, a world completely devoid of the knowledge of Christ, and a world that is very skeptical at, at Judaism and not even liking really what the Jews were presenting either, how can we be successful in getting the message of Jesus into this world? And he's describing a process. The work of the apostle is to break the ground. The work of the apostle is to till the soil and to introduce for the first time in people's consciousness the idea that God has done something remarkable in our time. He has sent his son. He has provided a path to salvation. They till the soil. After that comes the, word, the work of the prophet. And the prophet is those that bear the word of God. What is the word? It's the seed. The word, the, so the, the apostle introduces them to Jesus, and then the prophet introduces them to the word that establishes who Jesus is. Then the work of the evangelist is to grow that seed and bring it to fruition. And then the next part after that baby has been born, after that enlightenment has come, after that decision has been made to follow Jesus, people need pastors. They need pastors, shepherds. But Paul does an interesting thing here. When he uses the word pastors, and then he ties it together with teachers, the Greek suggests that these are not two tiers, but they're the same, that they're synonymous. That pastors and teachers work together to the same end and for the same reason to nurture and grow those who are in Christ so that they can join in the process of helping others to get to know Jesus Christ as well. There's, it's not pastors, then teachers. It's pastors and teachers. Both sharing a coordinated and cooperative ministry together. We are called to be ministers. Every time you teach Whatever you're teaching, preschoolers, whether you're teaching a discipline, you're teaching poetry, you're teaching music, 
You're teaching the core concepts of language and, and mathematics and science. It is not just for the sake of the subject matter, but to bring people closer to a knowledge of who created the world and the science that we have, who created the mathematics, who created the opportunities to have physical education, Alex. So one more passage for you this morning as a way of a, of a challenge, you might say. 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, a passage that we usually reserve for pastors, but I've, I've tried to illustrate in, in, in quick and in and, 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 and short ways uh, that there is an equality, there is a shared ministry between the work of the pastor and the work of the teacher. Um, I want you to think of this passage not only in that of the preacher, but of the teacher as well. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I know the school year is drawing to an end um, for, for most of traditional school. And uh, teachers and students alike are, alike are weeping at the stopping of the program and can't wait for it to start again. But it's something that I think is just a, a good um, reflection for us um, in a universal sense. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and uh, verse 1. Here's Paul's message here. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, the one who's to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and by his kingdom, preach the word. And again, I understand that sounds more of the, the ministry of preaching. We've also understood that preaching means more than just standing before a congregation and delivering a sermon. It is the presentation of the truths of God. Be ready Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Teachers, have you ever thought about that concept of being ready for whatever may come to you? I know sometimes you think, well, I'm here to teach geometry. But that day, you may be doing more social work than geometry. You may be doing more counseling than you anticipated. You may be a surrogate parent. You may be offering advice. You may be doing much, much more than what you anticipated. And I think that is all bound up in this concept of you never know when you step into the classroom exactly what the need that day is going to be. Be ready. And what does that mean? It means make sure Jesus is with you guys. Make sure he's with you. Be ready. In season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Now notice this, Paul, this is the heart of Paul. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And again, doctrine sounds very churchy. It just means a teaching. The time will come when they will not endure the truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And they will turn away their ears from the truth. And they will turn aside to myths. But you, be sober in all things. Endure hardships. I could not be a teacher. I'm not called to it. I, there may be similarities between the preacher and the teacher, but I'm not called to be a teacher. <laughs> endure hardships. Do our teachers have to endure hardships? Do you think this year has been a year of hardships? Endure the hardships. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. He says, you can't depend on me always being there for you. You need to depend upon the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. I have fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course, the course. And in the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to those who have loved his appearing. Our teachers are powerful. Our teachers have an enormous power in our society. They need our support. They need our prayers. They need our love. They need to also understand that they are called as ministers. It's not secondary to what you do. 
It is primary. In the public school, in preschool, in whatever context you have been given the opportunity to instruct. And the greatest lesson, the only lesson that really matters, the one that in the end, I hope every teacher will make it a priority to teach their students, is to love Jesus Christ and to love his appearing. That's the challenge. That's the charge that Paul laid upon all those who minister. And our teachers are part of that. Would you pray with me? Father, we live in such extraordinary times. And we, we live at times that those who are charged with keeping stability, passing the torch, raising up a generation in this complicated time, Lord, the work has never been harder. And Lord, I pray that you would ultimately and supremely Bless our teachers, every teacher, those helping with children's church right now, those working in our schools and charter schools and private schools and public schools, those working with little children in preschool, those at the collegiate level, those in independent task force, whatever the context is, God, that you would fill them with your spirit. Help them to be reminded of the privilege they have in every circumstance to draw people to your glory and to your plan. Lord, bless these individuals. Assure them of your calling in their life. And if it's not their calling, Lord, find doors that they can go through where they can be more successful. But raise up our teachers, Lord. Bless them. As this school year draws to a close, Lord, I pray that it would be a powerful time as the seniors get ready to graduate as all the other final activities come together, Lord, may this be a time of celebration. We love you, Jesus. Thank you that we could spend this time with you today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Hope to see you again this very next Sabbath.